Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today. My name is Rosa Stalteri, and I'm the Knowledge Translation Manager with CanCOVID and the Speaker Series host and moderator. It is a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Frank Milne, who will be discussing his work that he has collaborated on with Dr. David Longworth on what can systemic risk management techniques, such as stress tests and war games, and the global financial crisis, crisis sorry, teach us about implementing COVID-19 postmortems and preparing future pandemics. Dr. Frank Milne is the BMO Chair in Economics and Finance, as well as the Director of the Risk Policy and Regulation Graduate Program at, in the Department of Economics at Queen's University. In 2008 and 9, he was a Special Advisor at the Bank of Canada during the financial during the financial crisis. Furthermore, Dr. Longworth served as the Bank of Canada's Deputy, Minister, sorry, Deputy Governor, Chief of Research Department, and also was the advisor to the governor. So before I hand over the um, floor to Dr. Milne, I'd like to just uh, note a few things. The first is we uh, ask you to ensure that your microphones are on mute during the presentation, but we also welcome you either during or after the presentation to ask your question in the chat box or say a remark to facilitate some conversation and uh, or raise your hand if you'd like to ask your question live during the 10 minute question and answer period. Also, just a reminder that these sessions are also recorded on YouTube in about two to three business days. So without further ado, I'll hand over the floor to Dr. Milne. Thank you, Rosa. It's a pleasure. Uh, this talk is, is a, a summary, a very brief summary of four papers, working papers that I wrote with Dave Longworth uh, last year. Uh, two of them went up last year in the middle of the year and two of them came up early this year. The, uh, here's the order, this is the logical sequence. Uh, the first one is lack of pandemic preparation in many countries. We're not just talking about Canada, we're talking about other countries. Australia, the United States, uh, and so on. Uh, then this, the second one is how governments should prepare for future pandemics with sort of an overview. The third one is parallels with the global financial crisis where we try to draw some parallels out. It may seem peculiar to some people in health that there are parallels, but there are. And the fourth one is key elements of systemic risk management, war game preparation for futures. Actually, I'm going to talk mainly about the first and the fourth uh, and the others, two papers there, uh, just elaborate on some of the themes. All right, so what is a war game or exercise? Uh, some of you may know what this is, but it's really a simulation to test procedures in organizations suffering a stressful event. And uh, systemic risk management tries to deal with a system-wide stress test or a war game, where you look at the interactions between uh, private and public organizations, and the interaction between them and the public and problems, what you're really trying to do is to try to understand the weaknesses in the systems. It's an educative system, try and indicate areas of improvement and reform. The military do this all the time. It's bled over into the private sector and the public sector, particularly in the financial sector. Uh, so I think in, and it's also been used in the healthcare system. I'll talk about that in a minute. All right, the first thing we observed was most Western gov governments have struggled with the health, social, economic, and financial uh, sectors dealing with the virus. We're gonna concentrate not on the most direct consequence of the virus in terms of just healthcare, but on the also the related impacts of lockdowns and various other policies that have taken place. And we're gonna argue that there was a, a lack of adequate preparation for the pandemic in particular in these other areas, largely because lockdowns had not been thought through, I don't think. And uh, they were introduced in a system that was grappling with the consequences. Now we're going to give you evidence of uh, some of these assertions and what we're doing. If you want a lot more, there's in the papers, there's a lot more discussion. This is a very brief summary. Um, there had been war games played, uh, pandemic games or epidemic games had been played, but they really ignored, as far as we could tell, the ones we were able to discuss, find out about, they really ignored the economic, financial and fiscal consequences. 
And so they were purely medical or health based. All right, so what we're proposing is far more serious preparation for future epidemics. And in particular, what we want is in the war games is independent post-mortems of the crisis. So as we're progressing through the crisis, looks like hopefully coming towards an end, uh, we should be really looking very carefully at post-mortems of what we learned in this particular crisis, what was new, what was novel, and what, was, what we would expect. We want to use the lessons of the post-mortem to create new pandemic plans and stress tests and run systemic war games incorporating health, economic, financial, and fiscal strategies. And they should be used to make preparations for the future epidemics. In other words, we want to, this is not a game where we're trying to pass out blame or anything like that. What we're trying to do is how can we be better prepared in the future? Uh, now, pandemics, uh, as a aside, are just one of several environmental risks that require careful and realistic analysis. Uh, there are others I'll mention later. Uh, a good one in Canada to worry about would be a major earthquake on the West Coast, a major cyber attack that attacked the financial system and other systems. And there's a whole bunch of other ones that we could talk about, uh, particularly in countries like Japan, uh, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, they have emergency days that deal with uh, tsunamis, earthquakes, and so on, because they are risks, much bigger risks that they have to deal with. Now, the thing is that we know that uh, low frequency, high cost, this is from uh, basically uh, systemic risk when we're discussing it in financial systems, but it's true more generally, we get these low frequency, high cost uh, events that go through the social and economic system. And it creates uh, problems, not just directly, but long run consequences for the private, public and sectors. And uh, the thing that you've got to watch is that the private sector and government policies, if they are not properly prepared, they can amplify it. What we would like to think is they can dampen the impact uh, and because poorly prepared governments can really amplify the impact and they can blunder and make uh, decisions because they're not quite sure what to do. Uh, I'm going to make a careful distinction there in terms of information. Early in the COVID crisis, there was a lot of confusion about exactly the information we knew about the virus, its consequences in terms of the demographics, et cetera, et cetera. We should have information systems that try to distill as soon as possible uh, those types of uh, consequences. If we have a poor information system, it just takes longer for us to figure out what's going on. The other thing we've got to watch for is what we call unintended consequences. We mean by that is that we want to reduce the set of unintended consequences if we think more carefully. So if you're not prepared, there's a lot more unintended consequences. Uh, now, policy relevant war games are an important tool for preparing this, and they should be regarded as a normal method of planning responses to low frequency, high cost events, and just not an optional extra. Now, very quickly, I want to just have a study of some previous uh, uh, examples of pandemic war games. There was one done for the Ebola. It was a, looking at the Ebola crisis and the US did a discussion of that, what they learned about it. Uh, and there were a number of lessons were discussed by uh, Christopher Kirchhoff and there's a webpage you can find his report. I'm quite a long report. I just want to focus on a few things. There clearly were problems dealing with the preparation, communication across agencies, lack of appropriate equipment and effective strategies. Um, the humanitarian, military and health responders were not running periodic war games. They weren't very good at it. Another important finding was the limited use of pandemic modeling. Um, they didn't work very well. They were badly deficient. They seemed to work in the near term, but they, they didn't work very well in the longer period, largely because they were faulty into depicting social behavior. We've seen some of these problems in the models, uh, particularly in discussions in last year and more recently. Um, in fact, in that case, uh, they ended up ignoring the, uh, the models. Um, Kirchhoff in a more recent, just last year, uh, he, he observed that these deficiencies had not been rectified. Uh, and we'll see, uh, I'll just give a couple more examples very quickly of very similar responses. New York Times leaked a report of a 
Christmas, uh, Crimson Contagion in the US. Uh, it talked about, uh, again, a war game or uh, exercise. It dealt with the health organizational uh, dealing with the war game, but not the financial, economic or anything else. But there were deficiencies, particularly at the organizational level of communications. Um, but as uh, this game in the Kirchhoff report make, reported, uh, there was no economic, fiscal, social uh, analysis, as far as we could see, as far as it was reported to us, uh, in trying to deal with the virus. If economists had been consulted, for example, we would have immediately talked about economic and fiscal consequences. But of course, there are social consequences as well. And there are additional health consequences, particularly with lockdowns, that uh, we have uh, delayed um, you know, people being scanned for cancer and so on, and it's all being delayed. And so we have a delayed effect. Uh, and that's not isolated. There was a McLean's magazine uh, with a quick summary and it, it all has the same characteristics. They've been played. We couldn't find any evidence of economic, financial, fiscal implications. Um, they quoted a number of senior health and political figures uh, and little seemed to be done in these countries to actually use this information in restructuring the organizations and trying to get things up to speed. Now, we, Dave and I, Longworth and I, because we'd worked in the global financial crisis and subsequently all the regulation from that, we tried to learn to reduce the uh, likelihood of one of those events, or if it did happen, reduce the cost of the, of the consequences and you have to be prepared so although the COVID has a direct impact on population health and the health system, it's this other material that also creates damage and we have to try to factor that in. So it's these indirect effects, but they're a function of government responses. If the COVID didn't create it, it was because of government policy responses. So we have to think of the whole as a package now. So fiscal and monetary policies responded to ameliorate the impact of the lockdowns. We notice government debt has risen dramatically in most Western countries. It's very significant now, and it's created huge budgetary problems. I won't go into the details of it. But one thing that we should think about is government assistance in loans and so on. They were rushed in. There were problems with that, totally predictable. Uh, in our papers in, in August, we were predicting that the Auditor Generals would find problems in many countries. We've seen this in the United States. Um, so there are parallels here in terms of lack of preparation and then how do we improve things? Now, I also pointed out that the banks and the bank regulators and their supervisors use regular stress tests. They do them within the banks in particular areas, but they're also, and I was one of the people who was, and Dave and I were arguing for systemic stress tests and that's been done, we're not the only ones, but it's been done in the United States, it's been done here in Canada, it's been done in the UK, for example. In other words, we're looking at the whole financial system. They're either bottom up or top down. I don't want to get into the details, I don't have time. But these are uh, now standard. What I'm also been urging is war games in the sense that there are behavioural aspects that these types of tests don't really uh, test properly. And we should have war games where the people actually go through the situation and they have to think through it and we look at the problems that occur within the organizations in terms of behavior. Well, right, here's a very quick example. I don't want to spend much time on it. There was an Ontario SARS report in 2008 and this could have been used as a basis for a war game. What did we learn? How we do the war game? How do we think about how the environment changed and so on? And these are very useful gates uh, guys, not only for the regulators, but also for politicians and senior management in the private and public sectors. And particularly for politicians, as I'll argue later, and for senior management, what you get is a turnover. These are periodic uh, events that take place. And it's very easy for people to who have been experienced in this, they retire, they move on, new people come in, they've never had the experience. And so we really have an educative system that they have to experience in in a fairly precise way, what went on and what they could do about it. Now, one of the things we, as far as we can tell from recent reports, that these games were not played, and indeed the reports recommendations were not implemented. So when having done the war game, and there's, there's a lot of detail in the papers about this, of how you would do and a lot of references, a lot of material on it, 
you have a you have a carefully constructed and executed war game. And then you should analyze what where are the weaknesses, what are the organizational changes that we've got to make, and so on. Now they should be played regularly, test new systems and technology and stress them because the systems are always evolving and we don't want to you have something that was as they say in the military we're prepared for the last war we really have to keep it up to date there are always new risks and uncertainties and so in other words pandemics do we know something about uh, viruses are they mutating and changing in a way that their characteristics are changing and that may mean that we may have to have different policy reactions to it so we should be careful with that Complacency is dangerous. In, we are very familiar with financial uh, risk management and systemic, and complacency is deadly. Uh, you're not ready and you get caught out. Um, major un unexamined risk can be really costly because they impact unprepared systems, societies, and economies, and it can induce panic, costly responses. All right, so we've got to think about strengthening those weaknesses, but there's no one size fits all. We do discuss this in these papers. All right, one thing uh, I want to emphasize here is the training. Uh, we found this out discussing you know, the financial uh, stress tests and war games. And I, I'm going to be quite critical of economists here, but uh, currently many policy economists are woefully unprepared for this type of analysis. They really don't understand sophisticated strategic war gaming methods. Uh, they tend to, those methods tend to be used in foreign policy, strategic and military analysis. So they're not quite familiar with it. Uh, few macro and monetary economists understand the complexity of financial risk management and practices used by the financial system. So there's what we call silo. There's a bit of a silo problem here. Similarly, the health establishment only, a fit, in my belief, is only a rudimentary training in the appropriate economics, finance and systemic risk management. So again, although they may be very good to thinking about the the health consequences, these other components, they really aren't experts in the area. So we have a silos here. We must try to make the silos talk to each other and cooperate because they all interact. So we've got you know, graphic examples of risk management and planning failures across not only just health, but economic, financial and government sectors. Some of it has worked reasonably well in some countries, but in other areas, it's fallen down. It depends very much on the jurisdictions. And we have some good examples of that in our papers. One last point in this slide, communication policy is critical to avoid panic and political media discussions. There's a lot of ill-informed social media uh, influences poor political decision-making and what I call a doom loop where uh, people start to talk about fragmentary information. They try to emphasize it. There's a panic and it forces back for government action. And here's a conclusion. I don't want to go through any great detail, but it tries to summarize that there have been some countries I mentioned before, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, that they seem to be much better prepared, largely because they had experience earlier and they've created systems to deal with it. Although pandemic war games have been played and reports of pandemics, there seems to be little action in many cases of trying to implement the lessons learned or create effective or lower cost reactions to them. They should be played for low frequency, high cost events, not just pandemics, but uh, large earthquakes, mass cyber attacks, etc. Basically, the principles are the same. The front end looks different, but much of the later impact uh, has a similar effect. They should be publicly available. There may be some, particularly in the cyber warfare area, this is sensitive, but in most others, they may be, should be public where experts can discuss them and draw conclusions. They should also be summarized by an independent group who are on the side there watching what's going on. They summarize what's going on. What are the recommendations that came out of the war game? And it should be done while it's still fresh in participants' minds. And any lack of action should be reported. What we're trying to avoid is that bureaucratic lethargy, turnover experienced players, they can blunt and dilute future preparation. As I mentioned earlier as time passes history's forgotten crisis get neglected until we hit another crisis and we go through it again what we're trying to do is try to have an educative system where we keep up to date we keep the system strong to be able to deal with these crises they don't occur very often but when they are they're very costly thank you
Thank you so much, Dr. Milne. And uh, just as the um, the um, participant in the chat box has mentioned, there's a lot of new and interesting uh, terminology that we've learned today. So um, perhaps uh, if you can, please touch upon um, what you mean by the silo effect uh, for those of us who are in medicine or unfamiliar with economics. Okay, silos you find in any organization, any complex organization, where you'll find there are experts in silo in a group one, and they're all very familiar with it. There's another group over here of experts, but they don't communicate very well. Now, in some cases, it doesn't matter too much because they get on with what they're doing. But when the two groups start to interact, then you start to have a problem because they may not understand what the other's doing, or they take actions that have consequences for the other group, and the other group haven't been consulted. And then say, don't do that because it has other problems. I'm sure you would have this in hospitals. You would get silo effects in. You get them in all organizations, you get them in banks. So you'll have, for example, the credit people may not be discussing things with the investment people or the traders. So there are silos and it's a, it's a major problem in any complex organization. Does that help? Yeah, no, that was quite clear. Um, so we have a, a few more questions in the chat box that we just received. Um, one is from Christopher H. He says, uh, there is tremendous disconnect between biology of the pandemic and how the, and how the financial crisis in March 2020, a small blip in cases, but massive economic impact. By contrast, in December, a huge biological effect, but virtually no impact on the financial system. And the question is, how do you put that into a war game? Um the thing is, it depends on the on the sort of crisis you've got. The, the lockdown effects, when I'm looking at some countries, uh, the BIS has just come out with a report uh, where they point out the impact on GDP, major drop in GDP. Now, we talk about the economics. The financial system mirrors the economic system. So yeah, I'm not just concentrating on the stock market. We're actually looking at the economy, the downturn in the economy. Secondly, it impacted different parts of the economy very differently. So for example, the hospitality industry, the airlines, all those industries really got hammered. Other areas did extremely well. They've made a lot of money. So you found Amazon and a lot of companies like that have done extremely well. So it's created a bis disconnect. Governments are also borrowed enormous amounts of money and uh, have all sorts of support for unemployment. So this creates a lot of fiscal pressure, right? So we're talking about all of those types of things. It's a function of the particularly the very hard lockdown policies. I saw this in Australia. I saw it at very close range because I was there in the state of Victoria lockdown. And there was a lot of discussion about the economic and social consequence, the school lockdowns, children losing a year of school, things like that. So I'm not just talking about financial markets. I'm just, the financial market problem will come in because if you get increased defaults uh, with businesses going bankrupt, that's one of the consequences. Does that help? Yeah, I think so. Um, we do have a few requests on some clarification uh, yeah. to further distinguish between um, stre the, a stress test and a war game, and also a difference between a war game and a, a simulation modeling. Okay, that, uh, that, that, that's opened up a whole, a whole can. A stress test, in, certainly in the financial system, a stress test is basically in faith in their trading system. It comes from engineering, actually. The whole idea is you say, what happens if unemployment uh, went way up and so on? We have a list of things. What would that mean for our trading book? So we're actually asking what would be the consequences for our profit and loss? We're going to be a stress. Okay. Now, of an exercise, what would happen is that an exercise would actually run through the consequences of that. So then you would say, well, what we do then? So then you would have to walk, you know, walk your way through. And for example, it could involve the regulator that say, well, what happens if one of the banks gets into trouble? What would we do then? All right. So they would have to work through the whole system. This is what an exercise of war game, it would take into account the behavioral responses. On the other hand, if you're doing a computer simulation, these were used in the financial crisis for top down, bottom up. So uh, I've written quite a bit of stuff on this on terms of modeling. The modeling are, of course, just computational. We're making all sorts of assumptions to make them work. 
And we've noticed this in the pandemic modeling. There have been uh, attempts to try to build in more realism in terms of uh, the social consequences of certain types of behavior. Instead of talking about R for the whole economy, what we've got to say is what happens for, for example, uh, older people. We make differences according to comorbidities and so on. So does that answer that question? Um, I believe so. I think uh, Suzanne Stain also, you know, followed up with, given the need for radical collaboration in addressing these issues, I wonder if you think the term war game as an extreme conflict metaphor has its own behavioral consequences in terms of foundational mindsets, approaches, and considerations, and also replies, yes, thank you. So that was a good uh, answer. Can I, can I just comment on that? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, the, the name is, is, I'm using it in a very neutral, it's been used because it came out of the military in the beginning, uh, but it's been, it's been adopted into the private sector and, uh, and in other areas as, as called war games. But I mean, equally, they, they call exercises. So we could call it an exercise, right? I'd be quite happy. It's just a label. I mean, I don't want to have anything to do with thinking it's a war or anything or, it's, or we're all fighting one another or anything like that. That's not the point. It's essentially an exercise, a simulation is another word we could use. It's a real-time simulation with real actors as against a computer simulation, okay? That help? Yes, the next, um, the, yes, thank you. So I guess it, it was very helpful. The okay. next one um, is, I'll, I'll read the paragraph because I think it all sort of goes in together with the question. One can say that regular stress testing is essential, but there is a very real public service and political bias towards forgetting. FACTS and uh, GPHIN is a, a recent example. So how does one actually ensure that memories stay strong? For example, that the energy for stress testing does not wane. Good question. Uh, that's a very good question. It's something we thought about a lot in the after the financial crisis with the uh, financial regulators. Uh, and the thing is that you've got to have it as a regular occurrence. It occurs very regularly. And they do this uh, with in Japan, as I mentioned, Japan, Taiwan, etc. Uh, they do it with the national emergencies. And they do it every day. There's a day in Japan every year. It's called National Emergency Day. So it's on the books. It gets done. Now, the thing is that you can do it mechanically and you, so it's, you can have tick the boxes. That's a problem with these things is that once you get to tick the boxes, people tick the box and forget about it. So in some sense, you need a bit of a penalty up the back. That's why we wanted the independent group with some muscle who can report and say, this wasn't done, please explain, right? Now, there may be a good reason something's not done, but at least, you know, it's discussed and, you, and it's oversight. And if you're doing them regularly, if it crops up again, that's not a good sign, right? Uh, and I think also politicians should be involved in some of these as well, because there's a playbook that they have and they will experience it. There's quite a lot of turnover in politicians. And so they need to be carefully briefed and certainly their advisors carefully briefed on this. Can I add a comment or two, question? Yeah. Absolutely, go ahead. In the financial sector, we have the IMF, the International Monetary Fund at the international level and the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions, so you, which is quite a powerful organization within Canada uh, to look over the banks. Yep. But in the health sector, we have this provincial fragmentation. So can you see any way that what would be, should we have an at, at the analog of an OSPI uh, for health? Or as you say, this needs to be broader than just health. It has to include the economic aspect. So you know, how does one create an institutional home uh, to do this? The Auditor General report in Canada for the FAC and the Auditor General report in Ontario a couple of weeks ago, both pointed out recommendations that they've been making over the years that just yeah. haven't been followed. Yeah, I saw that. Thank you very much. This is a really good question. I haven't thought through the actual organizational detail, but it's something that's got to be thought through because again, the uh, provincial fragmentation, I, I was in Australia. I saw it in Australia with the states. The federal government there danced around above it, but the states were pulling the strings. We got very big differences in the states. 
out of uh, 900 deaths in Australia, 800 were in the city of Melbourne. And it had a lot to do with the way the ha that was, it was handled in Melbourne it was, and in Victoria. It was very badly handled. New South Wales had a much better system. So I think in some sense at the federal level, I'm not, there's probably a, some different models that could be done. I mean, in Canada, the, uh, you have um, securities regulation is provincial and there's been attempts to make it federal. I was involved in that back in 2010, by the way, there was a case of that. Um, so I, I would hate to get into a sort of problem with the federals, uh, with the constitution about it, but in, there does seem to be some sort of coordination at the federal level uh, in terms across the provinces because they are interacting. People move between the provinces and so on. And there's a lot of lessons to be learned between the different provinces. That's a long answer, but I think it's a, that's a serious question. Thank you so much, Dr. Milne. So it is uh, past 4.30. I just want to take the time to thank you on behalf of the Kent COVID Network uh, and our team as well for your time to present with us to us on this informative and timely research. Uh, for me, it was really interesting to learn some of this new terminology and, and also get a better understanding about the implications of COVID-19 on our economic and, and economy. So thank you so much. Um, I do wanna just mention that uh, we do have our next speaker series next week on uh, April 6th at the same time at four. Uh, to 4.30 Eastern time. So hope to see you all there next week. And thanks again, Dr. Milne, for your time. Thank you, Rosa.